Alright guys, it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous. Is this the first or second day of summer? Here on Sunday, June 22nd, 2014, up here in the little Buddhist retreat at my sister's house in the Green Mountains of Vermont. I could not think of a more gorgeous day to bring to you this week's Sunday Doomsday Sermon from, I guess, Doomsday Easy Chair here in the good life. I have not been around for the past few Sundays because I have been working for a living and not had a chance to read a book, but I have actually had a chance to read what I thought was a Bible of the Apocalypse by who I thought might or might not be a fellow doomsday prophet, a fellow named Bob Rice. The Eskimo and the Oil Man, the battle at the top of the world for America's future. And so I got this from the good old Austin Library. And what this book is about is, well, it, it, it's a book about oil development in the Arctic Ocean and what they're doing, hilariously enough, this was written in 2010 and 2011, right after the big BP blowout in the Gulf of Mexico. In the middle of all that, you probably remember that Shell Oil had big plans to start moving into the Arctic Ocean off the coast of Alaska. And what the, the oil man being referred to is this guy, this, this planet eater, this multi-millionaire planet eater from Shell Oil. And he was going up against the Eskimo in this case, being uh, one of these politicians, one of these these native politicians in Alaska having a little bit of concerns about Shell Oil Company moving into their traditional hunting and whaling uh, grounds and how they were going to work it out. And normally I do a long reading. All, all I'm going to read for you here is the jacket of the book and then I will give my review of this book without diving into it real hard. Okay, this is what I was led to believe that I was getting ready to read about, The Eskimo and the Oil Man. <clears throat> the Arctic century is upon us. A great jockeying for power and influence has erupted among nations in the high north. And remember, this was written almost four years ago, these words. At stake are trillions of dollars in profit or loss, U.S. security, geopolitical influence, and the fate of a fragile environment as well as the region's traditional people. As the ice melts and oil companies venture north, and I've had this rant how many times thanks to global warming caused by burning of fossil fuels with the ice up there melting. What are the fossil fuel companies doing? They're in this uh, head over heels uh, plunge up there to take advantage of the ice melt that they created to drill for more oil, to drill for more oil to create more ice melt. I guess they're trying to melt uh, the ice in Antarctica so they can head down there looking for oil after they've ramped, after they've gotten it all out of the Arctic. And of course, uh, this offshore oil drilling, the initial catastrophe is not the climate change, it is the inevitable oil spill that is virtually 100% guaranteed. The catastrophic 
environmental calamity that is guaranteed. It is not a matter of if, it is a matter of when, once we turn uh, these planet-eating sons of bitches at Shell Oil and every other one uh, loose up there. So anyway, as the ice melts and oil companies venture north, the polar regions may become the next Panama Canal, the next Arabian Peninsula. Now, and, and, and remember, this, <laughs> this is the ultimate irony, as this was written uh, several years ago. Now, Shell Oil plans to sink exploratory, exploratory wells in the pristine waters off the north slope of Alaska, a site that the company believes contains three times as much oil as the entire Gulf of Mexico. The Eskimo and the Oil Man tells this story through the eyes of two men, one an Inupat Eskimo leader on Alaska's north slope, the other the head of Shell Oil's Alaska venture. Their saga is set against the background of an undersea land rush in the Arctic with Russian bombers appearing off Alaska's coast and rapid changes in ice that put millions of sea mammals at risk, meaning the melting ice calls from the burning of fossil fuels e e even before these bastards get there with their drilling rigs. They're talking about in that sentence. <clears throat> the men's <coughs> decisions will affect the daily lives of all Americans in their cities and towns and also in their pocket books. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, but anyway, let's see. The Eskimo and the oil man reflects the issues dividing every American community wrestling with the balance between energy use and environmental protection, our love of cheap gas, and the romance of pristine wilderness. And going into this book, I believed incorrectly as this author, this Bob Reese or Rice, however you pronounce R-E-I-S-S, -S, uh, admitted when he started writing this book, he considered himself a staunch environmentalist uh, completely opposed to any drilling whatsoever in the Arctic. And after spending all of this time uh, listening to Shell Oil Company's unadulterated horse shit, what great stewards of the environment that they are, he ended up backing off a little bit and encouraging compromise. And he says it is time for both of the shrill voices to tone it down and let's see if we really can figure out how to do this right. And he, uh, com knowing the uh, reaction he was going to get uh, from both sides, all he manages to do here is piss off uh, both sides, the drill baby drill side and the doomsday prophet side. And I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs uh, from his conclusion about uh, uh, the, the final chapter. As the conversation progressed, it became impossible for me not to consider my own status 
as a reporter fly on the wall in both camps, meaning in the drilling camp and the environmental camp, over the previous year. And he's talking about, uh, this is a conversation he was having with, uh, oh, who was it? William Riley, former co-chairman of the Deep Water Horizon Commission. <sighs> Jesus. I told Riley that in researching this book, I had arrived at a conundrum as a writer who regularly covered nature and climate, and as a believer in global warming theory, I had started this project intending to be objective, but also suspecting that once the research was in, I would come away believing that the Eskimo and the oil man would remain antagonist and that my conclusions would put me in the environmentalist camp. What happened, however, was different and had caused me to agree with Riley, with this oil man, who was th this old, uh, you know, let's just go up there and do some exploratory drilling. Not actually pulling the oil out. Let's just stick a few holes around to get some better idea how much oil really is up there. Riley was amused at this. Quote, going to make lots of friends when this book comes out, huh? He said, I I yeah, right. I, I cannot imagine that Bob Rice, Reese, whatever this man's name is, has made many friends. He certainly has not swayed this uh, unapologetic, unrepentant eco-Nazi one inch. And the reason for this he, is, is not so much this book itself. And guys, I don't know. It, I, I, I guess for some background information uh, about what is going on up there in the Arctic, I, I give this book a qualified thumbs up but uh, but of course the big punchline to this book which you know is being written uh, several years ago was that after this book was written I don't know how much you remember and I just remember bits and pieces of it myself is, is this absolutely hilarious Keystone Cops affair with what happened with Shell Oil. When they went up there, they took, it was two ships. The, the, these two different ships going up there. When was this? About a, was a year, year and a half ago. Remember that absolute boondoggle when Shell Oil Company, I think they were into this, if I recall correctly, about five billion dollars. Five billion dollars. They took their little exploratory oil drilling ships up there. All they were attempting to do was stick a couple of holes in the, uh, in the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, the whatever the, the name of that Chickachuck Sea or whatever it was, and Mother Nature kicked their ass before they ever got a chance to stick their first little hole in the ground before the oil man in this chapter, in this book, this planet eater from Shell Oil who managed to convince this, this, this clueless moron, Bob Rice, that they could actually pull this off, they never got a chance to stick the first hole in the ground 
before Mother Nature came in there and, and, and just kicked their ass and showed Shell Oil who was boss that the oil companies proved beyond any shadow of a doubt if, if anybody was believing one word of this unadulterated horse shit that Shell Oil Company or any one of these other sons of bitches could go up there and pull this off they were sadly mistaken and it is an open and shut case the book has been closed shell oil got their asses kicked five billion dollars down the tubes and they went limping home with their tail between their legs as they needed to do uh, and i don't know what shell i i, I guess they have definitely abandoned plans to be up this year. I don't know whether these whether these idiots are still threatening to come back like a bad case of cockroaches or crabs next year or not. Mother Nature has told us all we need to know about drilling in the Arctic Ocean. There, it, it, it is, it, it, it is a, anybody who believes one word uh, of this unadulterated horseshit that uh, the, the Arctic Ocean can be opened up to oil drilling without a virtually 100% chance of a catastrophic oil spill which will make the BP Deepwater Horizon spill and the Exxon Valdez disaster combined look like a little puddle and this look like a little mud puddle uh, compared to what is going to happen if we turn these sons of bitches loose. I would love to find out what this dude, uh, Bob or Reese Rice, has to say about what happened after he gave his little green light to Shell Oil Company to take their exploratory drilling rigs up there. I would love to see the egg on this man's face. I hope that he has pulled his head out of his ass and returned firmly to the environmentalist camp. And of course, what we have going on, uh, the, the latest story, of course, as I reported last week, the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, handing off its number one, its first ever drone permit to take these goddamn drones into American skies, the, the who received permit number one from the US FAA would be British Petroleum, BP. So they could ramp up oil drilling in Alaska. I'm, uh, I think we're talking onshore oil drilling in Alaska but I'm not sure, guys, anyone who does not understand that it is the oil companies behind it all. If you need to see any evidence about how the U.S. federal government is in the pockets of big oil, you need to go no further than read this book, this hilarious book written four years ago and the number one permit granted for a drone by the US government to a multi trillion dollar multinational foreign oil owned oil company wanting to move in to the United States 
to create an environmental catastrophe. And uh, that is going to wrap up this week's Sunday sermon because I have to get to a puppet show. I've survived the glider flight, the, uh, the kayaking, the granite quarry tour, and I gotta wrap up my doomsday sermon and head to a puppet show. Bye guys.